All right. So what's happening, Travis? We are rolling. Oh, yeah. Look, yeah. Um, not much. Just chilling. I actually just woke up. I fell asleep at like an hour and a half ago. Oh, that's good, man. We're, we're in the same boat then because I mean, it's like just past 6 a.m. here. So yeah <laughs> which is funny because we try you know i guess i didn't do a good job of lining it up i tried to line up the times yeah uh, so it's, yeah usually it'd be right but for some reason i was just exhausted it's probably because i've been surfing quite a lot lately which has also been pretty cool i'm jealous i can't surf but i wish i could and it sounds like fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> so good and then it always come out of the surf just absolutely craving chocolate so that's a win too is it like swimming that I always feel like I always feel like I'm way hungrier after a swim? Yeah, hundred percent. It's like swimming and then as well as like a strength workout while swimming. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. Well, let's start off with I'll give you a chance to tell tell people what you do in your own words, kind of you know, what you're all about and um yeah, we'll roll from there. I'm I'm excited to get into it with you today, man. We've got we've got a lot of common ground, and I, and I want to ask you a lot of questions. Um, but yeah, yeah just cool. give, give give yourself a bit of an intro for people listening to who might not be familiar with you. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm how old am I? 23. Uh, from Australia. Um, a professional triathlete. Um, and full time vegan, obviously. Um, so I've been vegan for just over three years, I think it is now. Um, and being a pro triathlete for just over one year. Um, so I've been, got in the triathlon scene in like 2010, I think it was, um, just competing at my local club on a Saturday every, every now and then. Um, spent a couple of years just doing that, having hit out with dad and a couple of the local boys down there. And then it wasn't until like 2013, roughly, um, it was like the school cross country, uh, qualifying for the New South Wales championships. Um, and then I missed out in a sprint finish to like, go to the state level. Oh. Um, so then I was like, nah, that's it. I'm going to start training now. Cause I'd never trained before. I was like, oh no, I'll just rock up, do it. I'll be right. And then, yeah, I got just missed out. And then I was like, oh no, I'm training. Came back, started training and then made it the next year and from then on just got real competitive with everything I did. <laughs> uh, and I think it was, what year did I finish school 2015? Um, and then during school, I think my best result was like 14th in New South Wales uh, for triathlon. And then, yeah, left school a couple months later, it was uh, Australian age group champion for um what age 16 to 19 years um in 2016 went to world champs got 23rd in mexico uh, for standard distance uh, triathlon for 20 to 24 years uh came back the next year um as a vegan athlete uh so i went vegan in december 2016 had a couple months uh being vegan was national champion again um and then got i think it was sixth in rotterdam at world champs and then i was like all right one more year i'll have another crack at um the age group racing and then i'll try and go pro um and it also helped that world champs were on the gold coast so it was like half an hour drive which was pretty sick i was like yeah i'm gonna win the world champs home crowd it's gonna be amazing um, except I got injured that like May, May, June, July, I had a hip impingement injury, oh, um, wow. recovered from that in about August, I spent all August, um, with like a, um, like tonsillitis and then oh, no fun. ended up like the three week, three weeks before worlds. I'd only just started training about five weeks before worlds again. Um, it was like you wake up in the morning just hating life. Everything was so painful. And then the only reason I was getting up training was because Worlds were in like three weeks. I was like, nah, whatever it takes to get me there, I'll get it. And then got to the race, still on antibiotics. Um, wow. Ended up 
Yeah, had, didn't have a great race and ended up fourth. So fourth is like my most hated position because it's just off the podium. Like you're so close and got nothing for it. Yeah. Um, fourth and second because second's so close to first. But I, I, I hear what you're saying on the one hand that like fourth is in, in some ways like the worst position. But then again, some people would say actually second is in some ways the worst position. But yeah. uh, but either way, man, that's not bad. If you if you had not a good day and you hit fourth, like you must have had, you must have felt really really good about where your fitness was at. Yeah, yeah. Looking back a couple of weeks after that, I mean, it was like it was pretty rough for a week or so. I was just going. It was world champs. It was my last shot at like age group stuff, trying to get a world champion. Um, yeah. And then yeah, after the whole come down of it, I was like. Well, actually, I got four while racing antibiotics after an injury. I probably wouldn't have even exercised as quick as I was. Um, mm-hmm. And it's always been that T since then. That was 2018, maybe. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I'm like, oh, what if I could have been a world champion? <laughs> so yeah. now I figured I got to do it as a professional. <laughs> Wow, and for people who don't know, you race ITU triathlon. Like you're, tell people yeah. a little bit about like the level that you race at in triathlon. Um, yeah, so it's uh, so the ITU stuff is they do the sprint all standard. So sprints, seven hundred and fifty swim, um, for twenty k bike, five k run, and the standards double that. So one point five k swim, forty k bike, ten uh, k run. Um, the sprint takes me like 55, 57 minutes and the Olympic distance is about an hour 52, hour 54, 55, depending on courses. Um, so yeah, um, I guess the translation thinking- of that for, for people who don't understand is like very fast. Like, like Travis, you're, you're racing at the highest level of those distances, right? You're racing. Like- yeah. <laughs> so 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 when when you're seeing you know travis's results um you know sometimes i'm sharing my results of winning my age group or every now and then i might like i have won some races overall but uh you know not professional fields right you're like really in and amongst the big boys right and uh yeah, yeah. man you're you are smashing it dude and it's been really cool to follow your insta stories and you know check out your training and all that and i've really enjoyed you know you've got you've got some some good training near you, right? You've got, uh, talk, talk yeah. about your, your training, training, like where, so where exactly do you live and, and, and just talk about the sort of training in your area? Where, where are you at? Um, so yeah, I live in Tweed Heads, uh, which is just south of the New South Wales, Queensland border. Um, and obviously pre coronavirus, we would travel around, <laughs> train wherever. Um, but they've shut Queensland down. So to get into Queensland, it's a bit rough. You've got to have a certain pass, got to be in for work, uh, which is kind of a blessing in disguise because uh, the Gold Coast is really great. It's also really busy. Um, so usually I would train around Burley, Miami, which is like an absolute hub for your eyes. And if you've never been to Burley, you, you leave Burley with a broken neck because you walk along the beach like... <laughs> The whole time. For people who, if people are listening, you've just drastic, you know, dramatically gone right to left, you know, full right, full left. You're just always looking around. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's plenty of action to see and do. Um, but yeah, that so sounds it's, cool. I've never, I've never been to Australia, so um, I got to get out there. Yeah, it's, I've, it looks I've beautiful. Been, I mean, thank, thanks for sharing it on on your stories because it looks beautiful and uh, yeah. you've you've got a good. Uh, you got a good positive, positive attitude and you're like a good example of like somebody who's just there getting it done every day, you know, doing the training, putting in the work you've got, have you, what, what is that? You've I always see, you've got these like pre-rate pre-made meals. Is there like uh have you got like a business going there or like, are you doing meal, meal planning, like vegan meal planning for people or what's um, that all about? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, uh, I started as an ambassador for, uh, garden of vegan. So they, uh, do like pre-packeted meals. Um, so they're based in a, in a Burley. Um, so then all the meals are macro counted. Um, 
it shows all your nutrients on it. So if you're someone watching your macros, micros, all these nutritional stuff, that's all printed out on the um, meals for you. And there's like, what have we got now? Like 25 different meals, I think, roughly. Um, so I was an ambassador for them. Um, and I also do uh, like PT as my main gig, kind of, triathlon and personal trainer. Uh, and then I was after something like a little bit more steady uh, work-wise to help pay for travel and all other life expenses. So I hit him up and I was like, oh, is there any work? And then, yeah, so now I'm working in there, helping him make meals, pack it in, get him ready to send out. And it's really cool to be in the process of making something that's good for the people kind of thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining your, your life, like your sort of workflow. And it sounds pretty good, man. You're training triathlon like a lot of hours a week. How many hours do you train a week? And, and you're doing this, uh, this food stuff. It sounds like a good... You've got a good, uh, sounds similar to what I do, <laughs> but a yeah. little bit different. Um, but if people, if people are watching, uh, yeah, tell us, um, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about, sorry, I was just going to ask something. I forgot it there. It's too early in the morning. <laughs> well, I was going to, I asked you something and then I kept rambling. What did I? Uh, hang on. There's a plane flying up. It's a... Oh, is there? Yeah. It's super noisy. We haven't had planes in like six weeks because of all the lockdown. So that's, oh, yeah, that's the best word. Wait, there you go. Um, what was that? Uh, the I, I was just saying how uh, terrible I am as a, as a podcast host because I was, I was going to, I asked you something and then I kept rambling. Oh, oh. I, I, I remember what I was going to ask you. The, uh, so the meals, what, what was the, I, I did want to ask you this. What was the name of that, the company for the meals again? Um, we are Garden of Vegan. We are Garden of Vegan. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're setting up a good, um, a good day. What I asked was, uh, how many hours you train in a week? You know, talking about your your sort of approach to training. Let's okay. So maybe it's a bit different now because like all the races are canceled and whatever. But let's yeah. say like if you could have your ideal, um, let's call let's call it month leading into a race, right? Just just yeah. to be contextual to people. If you were to do a month leading into a race, what kind of like what are you looking at for training hours in a week? Uh, yeah. So it's roughly. Or about thirty hours of training. Um, I include and, and, yoga in okay. training. So you're including, like, like stretching, yoga. Like, if you're doing any foam rolling, do you include all that? Like massage. Uh, Is that all training or? Nah. So that's just swim, bike, run, yoga, and gym. Gotcha. Just that. Yeah. So and like, then, so other stuff on top of that. Yeah, yeah. As well as like rolling yeah. before and after every session. Um, all my meal preps, um, going to my osteo, doing all my recovery stuff on top of that as well. And then pre-coronavirus, working like 20, 25 hours a week uh, in the kitchen and then doing about 10 hours of PT work as well. So it's kind of like wake up, eat, go, 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 eat, keep going, sleep, eat, go. <laughs> you're dialed yeah. in, brother. It sounds like you're dialed in. Yeah, so there's, there's not much time for anything else, which is, I guess, what I'm enjoying now about what the world's going through is it's a bit of a break, which is nice. Um, do the things I don't usually get time for. But, you're um, here, you're here. Um, yeah. how, would, how would you say you feel about where you're at right now? I feel like you're ready to, uh, to take over the triathlon world, brother. I feel like you're... I saw, I've seen, I've seen photos of you, you running, man, and doing those. And I've seen some of your, you know, you're like, you can swim, you know, you're like a fish in the water and like a shark in there. And all you, all you Aussies, man, all the, all my like Australian friends, it's always crazy to me. Like the Australians can just swim, especially compared to us Canadians. Like, nah, we can't yeah. swim very well as in yeah. general. Actually, Hey, you know, there's, there's, there's examples, but like, I mean, like in school, you guys, yeah. I think you've got to learn to swim. Whereas here in Canada, it's, they don't, they don't make you learn. So, um. yes, I remember learning to swim before I learned to walk. Hey, like it, you're like, you're born and just thrown in the pool. It's like float, swim. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Just get it done. Yeah. Like even competitive wise, I was, uh, I think I was like best at swim racing when I was about 14, 15. And I remember swimming like a 27, maybe a high 26 to 50 meters free 
and that not even being like a state level swim. Yeah. So wow. just all down swimming the pool. in Australia is just so ridiculously elite that if like, there's like a hundred people going for three spots in the Olympics, it's just completely cutthroat. And then I noticed it in triathlon too, that like even at a, a state level kind of competition, the swim times are pretty much up there with the top ITU boys. And you go to a national level, they swim in the same times. And then you go to an international meet, there's not an Australian not making the pack kind of thing. So to try and cut it, at least in the swimming side of triathlon, is you gotta be as best, as good as the best. And then the rest unfolds. <laughs> That's my main difficulty, man. Help me with it. Help me solve my problem of not being able to swim. Can you just like, can I just download like good swimming ability? No, I actually, I actually love, that's the thing is I love the, the process of learning to swim. Like I'm totally okay with not being a good swimmer and like having to figure it out. Like I fully accept, you know, yeah, all that yeah. comes with that. And, uh, but, but the thing is what's exciting, right? Is, here you are. But I, first I want to backtrack though, because you kind of yeah. said, you know, I've been vegan for three years. Let's go back and unpack that a little bit. Like what, yeah. Um, you know, what I know you, you mentioned earlier sort of a bit of, of what happened, but let's, you know, what, what does being vegan mean to you and how do you see, I mean, you post about like, I see you put, you're sharing stuff to try to open people's minds. How do, how do you see, yourself um you know as sort of a vegan trying to find your way as a triathlete which what's what what are you what is your perspective on you know being being a vegan in a non-vegan world here you are you're in a position of smashing it at a sport that it has a lot of momentum right now um yeah. you know i see you as being able to have like a pretty positive effect on uh, on the sport and on uh you know people's sort of awareness about veganism in general so i'm curious as to how you you know sort of talk about veganism and and um you know what what role that that plays in sort of i don't know motivation for example like i yeah. i i find i get a lot of motivation from it but if you could just speak to that a little bit i'd be, I'd be curious to hear hear your thoughts yeah yeah so um originally i went vegan for the animals um so it was playing on my mind for a little bit. Um, and then my girlfriend at the time was vegan. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of what a vegan was. I just heard like vegetarians and I knew the vegetarians I knew through high school was like two of them. And that was through their religion. They're like, Oh, they don't eat animals. And I was like, Oh yeah, fair enough. You do you. I'll do whatever. I, if it, if it can put in my mouth, I'll eat it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, I remember watching a documentary on the cove. Um, the, the dolphin slaughter in japan and i was like oh man that's heavy so then i was like all right i'm not eating any fish i'm not supporting sea world i just went not nah, full not supporting this in any way and it didn't even click until like a while later that that happens to animals on land as well so then um i was talking to my girlfriend at the time about it i was like yeah i don't understand how people can like support sea world and still fish when like stuff like this happens. And then she goes, all right, look, don't hate me, but I just need to show you something. And then um, she was sharing a couple of vegan um, posts about what animal, what happens to like cows, chickens, pigs, all these animals that are so um, easily accepted to eat. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> all this yeah. stuff happens to all these land animals too. And then I was like, oh. So then the first thing that came to my mind was, can I, still compete be any good and get protein like that it's just like the typical thing that everyone thinks of is like oh can i get protein if i'm vegan and you can't it's actually super easy um so i'd actually just picked up a nutritionist a little bit before that um delana rame so she was uh like an ultra runner like a hundred miler type of ultra run just crazy stuff and then i remember going to her and being like I'm looking at going vegan. Uh, just wondering if it's possible to do that and still be an athlete. And then she was like, all right, yeah, here's like a whole book of information. Knock yourself out. And I was like, oh, okay, this is looking pretty legit. And then I remember being 
so worried and scared about it at first. I was like, how am I going to go to barbecues? How am I going to get tell dad? I don't want to. Right. Aki's cooking up. I was like, my whole social life's just going to be flipped upside down. And then I remember I was like, um, yeah, to my girlfriend at the time, I was like, all right, if you can cook me up a good spag bowl and a good chicken parmy, I'll go vegan. And then she did. And I was like, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I'll give it a crack. Um, and then it was, it was honestly nothing changed except when I went out to places, I'd have to like look at the menu first, see if they had any vegan options. If not, it was just like a salad and or like stock up before I went, which is what I did for years. Just eat like a bowl of oats or just eat whatever I could before going out. That way I wasn't super hungry um, going out places with friends. And I could just be like, oh, no. I'm watching what I eat. And then I use the athlete excuse quite a lot as in like, Oh, I got to, got to maintain whatever I'm eating. Got to eat like this. Um, right. And then I went through those stages that, you know how like every vegan goes through those stages where you're a calm, passive closet vegan and you don't want to upset anyone. And then that f- switch flicks and you're like, nah, I'm, making everyone go vegan now <laughs> it happens for me several several times a day bro several times a day <laughs> how am i feeling what am i gonna say to that yeah yeah so i hit that stage i'm still in that stage i think but learning to deal with people not listening better um but yeah so for like about two years um i didn't know any other vegans and then i went on a cycling tour uh, from Burley to Adelaide. So from Gold Coast to, all right down to Adelaide in South Australia. Um, and that was, that was the Tour de Froth. And it was a fully vegan organized thing. So that was the first time I actually met other vegans and athletes. Um, so it was like 800 kilometers of riding a week um, for four weeks. Got down there on, new year's eve and then i was like this is this is it this is the pinnacle of i'm being vegan i'm traveling around i'm sleeping in a swag waking up going for a hundred odd k ride a day and then yeah from there just started to get into like the vegan um social groups i started to actually see where what vegans did because i was so caught in the tri scene and just ate vegan that i didn't get that mingling kind of thing Um, I guess that's part of training so much that my social life really takes a stand back and training triathlon becomes my social life. So anything outside of that doesn't get any attention. And yeah, just working on that. I think I had like a year. I was like, all right, maybe it was 2019. I was like, all right, yeah, this year I'm going to focus on growing like my tribe or a community around me of supportive, uh, healthy, vegan active people um and then, yeah got to meet so many cool people and then that's i think that's one of the good things about um social platforms like facebook instagram all that is that you can link up with people and then i like, guess double-edged sword in that people take it for, for granted people yeah. people take it for granted all of the good things about social media and and how it lets us like connect with like-minded people who you know yeah. they, may, they may be far away or whatever but like we were able to find you know uh connection with people and find community so we shouldn't take that for granted that is a huge advantage that i think we would miss a lot if we didn't have it anymore yeah it's just i guess it comes to that appreciation thing realizing the good seeing the bad and just working that fine line not even a fine line just working out where you want to be in there yeah, absolutely. The tour de froth, by the way, going back to that. Yeah, we've got. I'm sure we've got a few uh, mutual friends. That sounds like so much fun, man. Is that? Do you know if if that's like a? I mean, obviously, maybe this year, maybe not happening. But um, is the plan for it to be an annual thing? Is that like a? Or is it like a, it's a pretty like small crew. It's like a pretty, like well, yeah. I mean, in the grand scheme of events, it's not like a huge event. Like, how many people participate in that? Um, I think when I. So I did it the first year uh, as a cyclist and there was like eight of us did the whole thing, but we maybe had just over 20 people um, that came and went and just did yeah. legs. 
Gold Coast to Sydney, Sydney, Melbourne, Melbourne, Adelaide, and like bits and pieces like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just organized by Shane and Simone. So they've just a couple of barely gone, yep, yeah, we feel like riding to Adelaide, let's make it a thing. And they just did, which is, it just blows my mind that they were like, oh, I just feel like doing this and then just made a thing of it. Um, and then I did it uh, December just gone as um, chef from Sydney to Melbourne. So I raced in um, New Zealand, flew out the next day, flew back home, dropped my bike off, flew down to Sydney, was chef for 10 days, flew out of Melbourne again. Um, and it was a bit of a smaller crew then. Um, but I think, I don't know if they're looking at doing it every single year, but they're looking at doing like smaller events, like a, a week long trip here and there just to kind of just give you that, uh, that taste that you get after it. Like there's everyone that I know that's been on tour is like, there's life before and there's life after tour. Like your life changes so much just from riding your bike every morning, sleeping in a swag out in nature and just eating all good vegan food with a bunch of legends. Like, Man, it Life sounds jam. like the best time ever, it, dude. Yeah. It it's does. Like, you, like a um, post-holiday depression. You come back and you, you try and fit into this rat race that we're all stuck in. And you're like, oh, man, I just want to be on tour sleeping in a swag again. Like, I've had times where I just want to set the swag up in the backyard not even sleep in the house. Me too, man. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, I uh, I love sleeping in it. Uh, I've got this tent that I used to like. I've I've slept in it many times outside, and oh, I love it. There's just something about being out, yeah. fresh air, on the yeah, ground. It does. Yeah, yeah. Really connected nature. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think that it's it's interesting, man. I I, I think we need. Uh, I don't know. We need some, we need some change in the way that we value the potential of our experience, like not just rat racing for the sake of, of, of more numbers in our bank accounts, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, instead of living, we're almost like racing to our death in that like, Oh, because this is the norm that we've been taught and told. It's like, you go to school, you go to uni, you get a job, you save up. By the time you're old and frail and no longer able to enjoy it, have some time off, enjoy life now that you can't move. And it's it's crazy once you see life for kind of what it is in that we're just, just like a fraction of time like that. And that who knows if there's another life, whether this is it, I've had some crazy hectic nights just thinking like, what if when we die, there's nothing like there's just not even the blackness you see when your eyes are closed, but you just don't exist anymore. And then it's just tripped me up so hard. I'm like, no, no, you definitely reincarnate. I'm like, <laughs> oh, what if I, like reincarnate as a leaf. Like, I have to live as a tree for the next uh, along the tree leaves for. And I got to this point where I was like, Nah, I would definitely like whether we're all individual little um, energies of spiritual just beings and we pass from a human body onto like a dog, a cow, maybe a cat, a dolphin, all these things. Um, I kind of like the idea that where this spirit that just goes on and on and on and never actually dies, we're just like this infinite up- and right now in this point of time we're trapped I guess in a human form with five senses and then we leave that and it's just infinite senses you get to enjoy so much more and it was it's kind of makes puts life in perspective in that nothing really matters so like your job doesn't matter money doesn't matter what you're doing tomorrow yesterday doesn't matter and because nothing matters, that's why it matters. Like, that's why now matters in that. I mean, like it's so cliche that tomorrow never comes. It's always today. It's always right now. But 
it really is that simple that you can stress about tomorrow, you can panic about what's happened before, but I mean, unless you're really living in now, appreciative of everything that's happening and looking at it positively, you're almost wasting all this opportunity and experience that you get endlessly every single time you inhale. That, that's, what's, that's what's valuable, right? And that's, it's so funny because it's so far away from what we're chasing, right? We're like chasing to like do the job that's going to make us the most value. And like we live in this world that like you, you, you can't really not unless you want to just be a recluse in wherever you go and I don't know, live off some yeah. mango tree somewhere. Like you can do that. The option's there, but like you can't be, I mean, there are probably, maybe there are some wicked, I've actually been to some places that are like sustainable not entirely vegan, but like, uh, actually one of them was, you know, just sort of like a waste. Like there was this one farm I went to this community out in Hawaii. It was like, it was all vegans and they were all eating fruit trees off the land. And like, it was super chill, like sustainable energy. Like, but it, that, that is still like that. Those kinds of communities are like, you know, barely exist anywhere. There's so few and far between, you know, being yeah. mostly in, in the, in the sort of rat race. Um, you know, we're always chasing it when in reality, like literally the most valuable thing is to your point, like consciousness that we do have right now. And at any moment could be taken away. Like, yeah. why aren't we more grateful? Or even the, even the odds of being born. I mean, we're, we're like, we won the lottery just to be born, no matter what, like anybody born with any kind of, you know, if it's a disability or like, you know, like, maybe you're born into a better or worse circumstance, like even, even a human being born into like a poor circumstance. I mean, obviously this is what I want to change about the way that things happen in the world. I mean, what I try to do is I try to create a better world so that let's say people born in, in, in a, in a country where their you know, the, their only option is to work as basically a slave, you know, whether that's for a corporation or, I don't know. I mean, in, in America, I think, uh, you know, in a lot of countries in the world, workers in animal agriculture, like that, that's the, that's the highest job injury rate is like a slaughterhouse worker, like slaughterhouse workers. That's like the most dangerous, like most injuries on job, I believe. And, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, <sighs> taking this in a bit of an interesting direction, I guess, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just the, the ability to say like, life is valuable the experiences that we're having just consciousness itself is valuable um yeah. we as i mean as far as animals go right i i have as much of a reason to believe that animals experience consciousness as i have to believe other people experience consciousness like yeah. i don't actually like getting out getting real philosophical here right the the experience of consciousness right like is I think therefore I am right that basic knowing like all I know is that like I'm conscious I don't even know for sure that I'm in a human body I could be a brain in a vat I have no way of proving that I'm not in some VR brain in a vat right so yeah. that's just to say that you know talking about some excuses that people might make for justifying not being vegan they'll say things like you know humans are special we have some kind of you know because we are all human we have like a special kind of consciousness like a soul that maybe animals yeah. don't have some people will make that but we don't actually like i as a subject you know as a as a human being having an experience i don't actually have any better way to prove that you are actually conscious than say a pig or a cow like i can look at you i can see your emotions you can respond to things just the same way that a cow can there's no yeah. difference. And we don't know what happens what, when, when we die, right? We don't know what happens when we die. Um, if you believe in reincarnation and karma, then, oh, man, I don't want to be a part of what's happening to animals because that will not, that will not help one's karma to be contributing to that, right? Yeah. Oh, man. But it's, but it's uncertain. It's uncertain, right? And I think that what you can take from that or what i take from that is like oh man i read this i read this actually i listened to this audiobook the simple art of not giving a fuck i don't know if you've checked yeah, it out I yeah, haven't read it though yeah good man it's good i i, I don't want to spoil it but uh yeah i mean there's certain things you can do like just to sort of allow yourself to see like to get a taste of like death and i mean i don't want to 
I, everyone, everyone needs to have their own sort of personal relationship with death. And um, it's kind of a weird topic, but in, in a powerful way, like if you can get close to death, like let's say, like even just putting yourself into stress, right? Putting yourself into a stressful situation where it's like, like I had a cold shower. Like I was thinking about cold showers. I don't know if you do cold showers. I like to like take a nice sauna yeah. and then after the sauna, you into them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, I do man. all the Wim Hof stuff. Hey, it's so good. And, and the thing is like, if you just imagine, like what if, the, what if I was actually like stranded in Antarctica or some gnarly situation like that where like, you are like exposed to cold and like you will eventually, you know, I mean, Wim Hof, whatever, if you, if you're like in ice water for long enough, eventually you're going to succumb to the element. Right. So I guess even just doing a short, like cold shower, right. It gives you a glimpse of that sort of like that. It gives you that stress response that is a warning to something that might kill you. Right. So in a way that's like getting connected with death or you can think about that. And what I find that does is something like, I'm just using a cold shower as an example. There are lots of things you could do. You can, you know, fly down a mountain uh, on a mountain bike and like, you know, get that rush. Like there's lots of ways you can get that kind of connection with death, you might call it. But, uh, but what it does is when you sort of almost taste it and then you come back and it's like, oh, everything's okay. Like I'm not in immediate threat of dying. And like, it, it gives you this sort of, uh, I think it's like a renewed sense of gratitude and it's probably unconscious, but it's sort of like a restart. Um, and I think you get, I think that's why, I think it's part of why people get like, I don't know, the endorphin like release that they do, like that feel good experience after like exercise or after say like a scary movie, right? Like why do people like scary movies? Like I never understood that until recently i kind of like had a bit of a revelation like, that's why people like scary movies because like they yeah. come out of the scary movie they felt like they were gonna die the whole movie and then they yeah. come out of it and they're like oh my god like everything's okay so yeah. that's super fascinating because no i just you you started talking about um you know what happens when we die and and i think that i just mm. want to share that because for me i've been yeah i've been thinking about that a lot lately and it's yeah. uh <laughs> yeah well, I can't do scary movies, hey. Man, it's I can't just, either. It rattles me deep. I had, um, what, what did I watch? Um, the Conjuring? It's, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, so it's like this family move into this new house. It's a big like mansion thing. Like your typical haunted mansion. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it. And then this like, this ghost or demon, whatever it is, it possesses, um, as the kids are running around finding the house, oh man, I got tingles of it now. Uh, <laughs> it's like they play this like knock and find, or like no, you clap. It's like, and then um, that's like hide and seek, and then everyone has to clap three times, and then this demon like knocks on the door as the clap, and then the little girl opens it thinking there's someone in there. It possesses her, um, and then everything that happened in that movie happened to me for like the next month, whether it was like a subconscious thing or what I'm like, am Dude. I connected to this? Um, Cause when I was little, apparently like, I don't know if you know Byron Bay, but pretty hippie town. Um, I've my heard parents, of Byron Bay. Yeah. I was, I was in the pram and then they were going through Byron or the back of Byron somewhere. And this hippie dude comes up and he just looks at me and goes, your baby's spiritually connected. And I'll, I was like, what? How come you guys never told me this? And then I, when I was little, I used to um, have like these dreams where people would take me and then I'd wake up in the morning with like marks on my arms from like grabbing myself in so scared I'd be taken away. So I was like this weird thing going on. And then whenever I watch a scary movie, this stuff happens. So in, in the movie, they wake up at 3 or 3 a.m. Um, and all the shit just hits the fan. So then like for the first week, it was really cold at 3 or 3 a.m. And then I woke up for a week, 3 or 3 a.m., freezing in December. So it's like in summer. It's like 30 degrees at night. What? Are, you, um, are other people, you're the only no, one? Only one. And I was sharing a room um, with my brother at the time as well. And then he didn't notice any of it. Um, there was, and then the next week, it smells like, it's a really bad smell, like something's dead. And then, I, ha- I could smell this horrible smell for weeks and like actually no it was just one week 
And then in the movie, it was their dog had died. The demon had like killed the dog and it was just outside. And then we had a dead rat in the shed out the back for a week. And I was like, nah, this is too much of this is happening. This is crazy. And then um, I must have been like 15, 16. My brother was about 12 or 13 at the time. And then um, he, like he's pre-puberty, had like that squeaky little innocent voice. And then I remember he was tossing and turning and mumbling. And I was like, oh, hey, Joel, shut up. Like I'm trying to sleep. And then he just like sits directly up out of like his sleep and just turns at me like robotically and goes go back to sleep in this real deep voice i was like what is happening and then he's just like stood up out of bed walked over to this closet and just like headbutted it and just stood there and i was like oh man i'm out of here hey <laughs> what like, yeah it was heavy so that was that was my last and probably only encounter with a scary movie dude dude i i think you're like some you're some like reincarnated like i don't know wizard or something who's here on a mission to uh be a triathlete and make the world go vegan so you just keep doing what you're doing because i'm like pretty sure that's what your life's purpose is is just to like (laughs) go on and be a legend triathlete vegan uh advocate so you don't you don't don't worry about like scary movies and like all that stuff man just just stay just stay away from that stay on your path all right I'm good with that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. Dude. Well, like, uh, man, I don't want to let you get away without uh, talking a bit of, of uh, triathlon nerd um, uh, topics here. So I I just had a, um, I just had, uh, I just had um, a great podcast episode. The last episode we did was an interview with Lee Grantham. I don't know if you're familiar with Lee. He, nah. he is a he's a Nike runner, man. So he's running for Nike, and he's trying to he's trying to set a new record for the uh, the one hundred k. Okay, yeah. And uh, he's been plant based, I think, for the last like three years, and just loving it. And yeah. we had a conversation about um, fasted training was one thing that we talked about. And yeah. Just going back, because I know you mentioned you got your your coach. What was the name of your coach who, who dumped you with all the you know put dumped all this information about plant based diets in front of you? Who who, who was that coach again? Uh, Delano Rame. So, so, so in yeah. that in that stack, right yeah. of of information, you know, did you read anything about you know fasted training? Because this is like a really hot topic right now, and it's something that I I'm trying to learn about. So, you know, fasted training. Do you do it? If so, why? If not, why not? Thoughts around it? Uh, So what I remember from it, um, I can't remember much about fasted, but I remember um, being um, like months out from a race, uh, just hitting just above the intake of what your output is. So input matches output. And then the week, um, so a fortnight before the race, so you'd start two weeks before the race, um, you'd go like a, a carb depletion. So you'd get less and less carbs, um, still maintaining your same output, but that way the body gets uh, less carbs into it and it kind of craves them more. So that as you then increase, like re-increase carbs into your diet come race week, that holds them, stores them better because the body goes into this panic. Oh, when are we going to get carbs again? I don't know. Like we've got to hold these. So then, like we deplete carbs, keep the training up. And it was a real, it's a rough stage for my family because me without carbs isn't a positive person. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I need food. Like, <laughs> yeah. With it. Um, so then like the, probably about Tuesday, Wednesday, same time as the training comes down, the carbs come up and it's like, you reintroduce a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. And then you can start carbo loading and you go a bit over the top of what you need. And then say the race is Sunday, um, you'd, you'd pretty much max out Saturday and then have like, instead of the, I feel like the common thing is to just have pasta the night before a race or a big, one big dinner that's heavy on carbs. But then I also think that from what I've learned and know from that is that if you all of a sudden up your carbs for one meal before a race, 
Um, not only is your stress and you're so anxious about the race, but then your body's got to intake so much more food than it's used to. And you start getting like those night sweats, and cramp at night because your body's needing to draw so much energy to just break down all this food you've all of a sudden just eaten. Then you've lost so much energy for the next day. So instead you you grow it over four or five days, increasing the carbs. Um, just have like a standard normal meal. Um, I mean, my, I still have a spag bowl before a race as like an OCD thing before every single race, but I don't go way over the top. I'd have like just your standard spag bowl that I'd have any other day or night before a normal training event. Um, and then I find that way the body's not in a state of almost shock trying to break down all these carbs. It's like, oh, yes, carbs, this is great. And then um, like for a race, for me, I only have – I wake up, have a cliff bar, um, and then have one cliff bar an hour before a race. Um, so this is for sprint standard and half Ironman races. Um, just because when I was younger, if I had a bowl of cereal or a bowl of oats, I'd pretty much throw it up on the run. So I was mm. like, okay, I don't like throwing up. How can I mitigate this? And then it kind mm. of came down to eating enough leading up so that race morning i didn't have to eat as much and then i'm sure as you know like you get nervous before a race your bowels pretty frequent as a vegan anyway right if you're to carve up heaps the night before in the morning of that's like five seven toilet trips before the race so i try and cut down that as well yeah but, timing timing and and dealing with all the lines that are at all the porta parties yeah. in the morning and stuff, or the bathrooms wherever you are. Um, yeah, races. It's not it's not fun. Actually, um, I would I would suggest, man. I don't know if you've tried it, but for me, it's worked very well. Just just sugar water, bro. Just sugar water. Yeah, right. Um, because uh, like who you know, you, you just want to top up your glycogen. You know why yeah. why take in any fiber? Why mess around with anything? Like literally, just sugar water morning of a race. And, you know, you, you just, it's really easy. You just measure out your, your calories. And uh, if any yeah. of you guys listening, try that. Let me know how it works. It's been absolutely like secret weapon for me. So we'll leave this here at the end of, uh, <laughs> of our podcast as the, the golden nugget for the end. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. You let, let me know how, how, how it goes with, with you. But, I mean, you said that the, uh, the cliff bars are, are working for you. Or what, what was the other bowl? What did you say? You said some kind of a bowl? Like a, a what bowl? I'm not even familiar with what you said. Oh, spag bowl, like spaghetti bolognese. Oh, oh, okay, spag bowl. Okay, I've never heard it called that before, but okay, spag bowl. I'm going to start saying that. Okay, it must be an Aussie. <laughs> Just destroy them. Spaghetti, so did you say that that like uh, that's the dinner before? Or, yeah. were, or were you having that? Okay, so that's your, yeah. yeah. And is, is, do you still do that? Sorry, you, you said that you, like night before dinner, you'll still have kind of a, you know, but, but not overdoing it, as you said. You'll still, you know, yeah. carb up and... Yeah, yeah, just a normal night's dinner yeah. um, of spag bowl. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the, coming back, so we had um, the fasted training. You haven't really, yeah. you haven't really dabbled with that so much, more so just sort of looking at um, yeah. macro, macronutrient well, ratios. Um, I've, I've looked into it a little, um, actually just recently now that we've been forced into off season, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll have a try with that because a lot of um, my vegan healthy friends that aren't uh, endurance athletes and just like to be vegan, they're all about like, oh, we'll fast till lunch and then we'll roll till four and then, then we'll have a cooked meal. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like, I just like to eat food kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. And I was like, oh, all right, I'll have a go, see what it's like. Um, and then I had, had about two weeks off from training, I'd just wake up, do some yoga, meditation, probably go for a surf. And I'd just not eat until after I did that. So I'd just wait till lunchtime kind of thing. It felt really good. And I was like, oh, maybe I could try and do this with training. And then I wasn't um, going into it like, oh, I have to wait till this time, I have to wait. I was like, I'll see how I feel, see how it all goes. Uh, so I started like, I'd wake up in the morning, do some yoga, meditation and go for a swim. And I was like, that was fine on an empty stomach. Um, I did the same for a run. 
Um, I'd do the same for a ride, but anything, any ride longer than an hour, it would, I'd deplete quite quickly. So then I was like, all right, I'll, I'll eat before a ride. And then I'll try and not eat before a run or a swim. And then as I increased my training back to normal training, it was like, no, nah, I have to eat <laughs> as soon as I get up. Um, except for my run days, I'll just have a cliff bars breakfast. Um, whereas I'd usually have a bowl of oats for breakfast before any other training sessions. But I think it definitely does have its, um, its benefits of a faster training. Uh, just whether I can do it, I don't know. <laughs> just eating is, eating is a big part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah for sure i mean training 30 hours a week right uh yeah. I, I yeah i mean i i shared my thoughts on on sort of the last episode but just to reiterate a little bit i mean it, i think it's um from what i i've read some uh some studies well a study that was done gtn linked to it actually um yeah where they talked about it's, it's essentially like if you do 20 minutes of very easy fasted training, say like once a week, like, like say like you get up and you go for like a 20 minute walk, right? Like low intensity, like exercise fasted first thing in the morning for, you know, half an hour, 20 minutes. Uh, what that can do is it, that, that basically helps you produce, and I need to look into this. I, I should have looked into this since the last episode because I wanted to look into it more, but you produce like certain, um, things in your body that that are used to metabolize fat basically maybe you know what that i don't know what it is that metabolizes fat that your body will kind of produce like is it would it be the ketones because you've been fasting from the night before is that what it is ketones i think, I think it is like it, it hits a state of ketosis and then starts burning yeah yeah you, you basically like up your your the percentage of energy that's coming from fat right you increase the percentage yeah. of energy that's coming from fat by producing more ketones right i think i've got that right yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. So, you know what? If I'm wrong, leave a comment and just like <laughs> let me know the truth. If you're if you're a, a, a you know if you're a professional and you know you're an expert in the field, yeah, let me know. Little... Open to being wrong. Not a, not an expert, but just what I've what I've heard is that that yeah. 20 minute easy thing, you basically you get the same benefits um, as you would from doing like a super long fasted um, workout. Like you don't get any more benefit basically from doing much longer than say 20 minutes fasted is the, is the, what I came away from. So yeah. how I implement that is similar to you. You know, most mornings I'll train, I tend to have like maybe a handful of fruit, whether it's, you know, a banana or a couple of bananas or, um, but I've done oats before I've done noodles in the morning just before training as sort of a, you know, a standard thing. Cereals also something I've done, you know, overnight oats. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I think that the benefits what like the conclusion that I came to is that the benefits of keeping your immune system up and recovering after the, the training sessions, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, it's not worth, uh, you know, compromising those benefits of keeping your immune system up, getting good recovery by, by not training fasted. It's not yeah. worth any benefits you might get in, in burning fat. People are like so obsessed with, you know, keeping it low carb so that they only burn fat because they think that, they think that the only way they'll burn fat is if they don't eat carbs and they get into ketosis, which is like, it just demonstrates like people actually think that and it's just, it's just so wrong. Like it's not, you're yeah. always burning fat. You're always burning a certain percentage, you know, and it's yeah. not, it's not the end of the world to have topped up glycogen. And in fact, as an athlete, you, I would think you would argue that, you know, you, you're going to be able to perform your key training sessions at, at a high level. I mean, you're, you're racing sprint distance triathlon, you're doing, high intensity intervals, even people who do long distances of those are going to do some high intensity training. But like, yeah. you know, for me, if I'm doing a VO2 max session on the bike, you know, I'll, I want to make sure that I'm fueled and I can really yeah. push myself and get as many Watts as I can. So, um, so that's, that's cool. So I think um, now not to say, by the way, like we do agree kind of on this point of fueling and we're not doing faster training. Like, I just yeah. want to like say that I'm not, necessarily against especially vegan athletes like if, if you're if you're vegan and you want to try doing higher fat you want to experiment i guess that's on you and um I, but i like to give people a template that i think is i don't know i think is safe but lee lee said on the last episode he said don't give people a template and i've been thinking about that because he's like well you know because he's he said um 
you know, if you give people a template, like, are you responsible for what people go out and do? So uh, I, know, I know he trains. I wonder what your, what your sort of thoughts are on, you know, when you're talking to people that you're training, right? So you have, you have clients, personal training clients and stuff. What is like, do you give them a template? Like how much of a template do you give them? And like, what does that look like? Do you have a, um, do you have sort of uh, a guideline that you, that you give people like some fundamentals that you believe in? Like for me, I, you know, I think, um, you know, there's, there's certain fundamentals that can be taught and I just wonder what, you know, how you think about that. Like what are the key things that you try to get across people? And maybe, maybe this would be a good place to end is like, if we could, if we could give you, if you could give, you know, some advice to people who are listening, right? What are some things that you're pretty sure will help people, you know, feel better and get fitter and all that? If you can maybe give, give people a little bit of a uh, little bit of advice to close this out here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess it pretty much comes down to uh, the personal experience in that I know what's right for me. Therefore I think it's right under the right circumstances for you. Um, someone else may stumble across something that works for them and they'll be like yeah this works great everyone should be on this i don't think there's one set thing for everyone because we're just so unique and so different in everything we do um but obviously the i see it as everything you absorb um has properties so whether whether you're watching calories and you're like oh i'm like the other day, this I had some chick come up to me. And she's like, "Oh, I can only have two thousand calories a day." I was like, "Why? <laughs> Why don't you train more?" I was like, "I have like easy six, seven thousand calories a day, and then if I feel like I'm putting on weight, I just eat more fruit or veg instead of heavily dense stuff." Right, right. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is to stick to something you can maintain, or at least a goal that you can see in your mind is working. Um, and then even if like instead of being like if you're someone whose goal is to lose weight or um grow muscle instead of looking down the track at exactly where you want to be obviously have that in mind but then also be aware enough that it's like all right today's three goals before lunch are i want to wake up i want to feel positive i want to be able to look at myself well i want to know how i need to get to the next step and then three steps before like three goals before i go to sleep are I want to at least hit one of my eating goals, one of my training goals and one mental goal. So like look at myself and think of myself in a positive way. And I think once you make a positive relationship with whatever it is you're doing, it'll work. So instead of being like, Oh, I need to, I need to train 30 hours a week. If you straight up just go from like one session a day to trying to train 30 hours a week, there's a fair chance you're going to injure yourself and not be able to do any of it. Whereas you go, all right, that's, that's the end goal. So this week I want to train seven hours next week, eight, nine, 10, have a week, a little bit break, come back, build up to it again. Um, I think it's just breaking everything down into small, like bite sized pieces. Kind of like if you're going to eat a cake, I like everything for me is food related. So it just always comes back to food analogies. Like if I was to sit down and eat a chocolate cake, I could pretty much eat like a whole cake, just straight up eat it, but I'd feel sick. But if I was to just slice slices of a cake, have them every now and then, maybe a couple a day, maybe one a day, I'd, I'd still eat the whole cake, but I'd get to enjoy it more. I wouldn't feel as bad after it. And it would kind of, it would work better for me. Whereas someone might be able to eat more cake or less cake in a day than me. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, you just got to experiment with what works for you. And it's so hard to give someone like, All right, this is, this is the template or like in your, like with the template thing of like, here, yeah, go to this, do this, it'll work where it's like, it works for me. It might work for you. It might not, um, play with it, experiment, go more, go less. Um, and just whatever makes you happy, happy and positive, And then. Even if it doesn't, if you're aware enough to realize that something isn't making you positive, whether it's training, eating, life, work, as long as if you're aware enough to realize something's making you negative, you're already on the right track to fixing it because so many people don't realize they're just in this state of stress and negativity and they're like, oh, my life's horrible. Instead of being like, 
all right, I don't enjoy my job. Why do I work? Because I want things I don't need. If I stop needing these things, I stop wanting these things I don't need, then I don't have to work as hard. I don't have to hate my job as much. I get to spend more time with family. I get to spend more time training. I get to enjoy the food I eat more. And it's just this massive thing. And it all comes back to just being happy and positive, I guess. Dude, I love your perspective, man. You've got, you've got a really, really great way of, of, uh, of, of bringing things together. And I love that cake analogy, dude. I love how you just, you switch from, you know, this thing where you're talking about wanting to train and getting super, you know, super disciplined about your athletics, you know, and getting in shape. And then that same discipline, because a lot of people do need more discipline in, you know, yeah. when they want to get into like this, that's probably, I think the biggest thing that a lot of people can use in a coach. I mean, motivated athletes, at least like people who are gung ho at the beginning, they're yeah. so gung ho. They got so much, you know, so much energy. They've, maybe they've decided they want to do a goal. So they get a coach and, or they, or they get a training plan maybe, or they, maybe they don't, right. This, a lot of people they jump in and say, okay, here I go. I'm going to go out. I got to run a marathon. Hmm. I think I could run 20 K. So I guess I'll just go and run 20 K as fast as I can yeah. and see how I go. And then, you know, like rather than breaking it down and it, and it's, it really is the same, the same philosophy, but just in a different form with the cake that you said, right? Like if you're going to, if you're going to sit down and, and enjoy some cake, okay, well, how do you want this experience to go down? Do you want to savor each bite of, you know, a decadent vegan cake, which I mean, it's still cake. I mean, just cause you're vegan doesn't yeah. make cake healthy, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make cake feel any better. Um, you know, if you eat a whole one. So, yeah. If, you know, if, but if you think about it as, okay, here's a slice of cake, here's a day of training, right? Mm. Let's take it. Let's take it as much as we can handle. Let's take as much as we can enjoy as much as we can recover from. Like it really is, you know, you can apply that same philosophy um, to, yeah. to different areas of, of life. And, 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 and as you said as well, you know, adding to that, making sure that you're doing, you know, actually looking at what you're doing in your life. Like, are you, do you want to be eating cake in the first place? Maybe you want to be eating something else. Do you want to be doing triathlon in the first place? Like, like, you know, how is everything, you know, what's your career looking like? Like just being able to have the awareness and that's to your point as well. Um, talking about awareness, yeah. like what are we doing here? What am I doing on a day to day to day? You know, keeping, yeah. keeping tabs on how we're spending our time and you know, how we're, how we're moving forward with our goals and all, and all of that. So I love, I love the way that you, uh, that you look at things, Travis, you got, you got some, you got some good, uh, some good, some good experience to share and you're, you know, you're still very, you know, young guy and you're, you're up and coming, but I, I've got a lot of, uh, I've, I think we're going to see good things from you, man. And I look forward to, uh, to, to seeing when you're, Toeing the line next with some of the other some of the other pros. I don't have they given you any any information about. I'm sure it's all just kind of up in the area eh, with races. Yeah. Like you, you don't have any special insider information. Everybody's uh, everybody um, else. All I know is that uh, world champs this year have been cancelled. Um, Olympics have been suggested for 2021, but they're still probably not going to happen because the qualifying events can't happen to qualify for the Olympic event. So they just may not be in the Olympics until 2024. And, and actually I've got one more thing. And I, I let's uh, let's, let's close it out here. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much of your time and it's getting late there. But if, um, if we could look to a, to a future where we're racing again and, you know, things are happening. I mean, what, what are you looking at down the road in the next, you know, the next couple of years? Like what have you got in your sights in terms of races that you'd like to do and, you know, go, or, or just goals in general for your life? Yeah, uh, yeah. so with triathlon, I remember my first goal was to just go to a race and be respected and people be like, oh, that's Travis. Like, oh, cool, good, eh? How you going? And then <laughs> cool, I, go, I love that. That's a good, that's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, the, like, I got that now. And I'm like, oh, sick. And then yeah. <laughs> now I'm at, like, I want to be able to not have, not have to work an actual job to pay for triathlon like my goal now is for triathlon to self-fund itself for me to be able to go and travel anywhere any race in the world rock up um and not be out of pocket for it um obviously i mean i think it's everyone's goal is to become a world champion but i think at the heart of that is just to be the best you can be the best like you don't want to give up being like oh what if what if i could have done more or like finish your career like oh i might have been a bit faster here might have been a bit faster there 
Um, mm-hmm. So obviously, it'd be sick to be world champion. I uh, ultimate ultimate end goal would be to have a race so well, set a world record that is like unbeatable for years. Um, but then at the same time, I'm not I'm not phased if I don't get there. I just want to just want to get to a stage where triathlon supports me. I can then support triathlon. I can then give back into triathlon sporting communities, stuff like that, and just be able to be the best that I could be. It's like, you, like when you believe you deserve something, you don't give up on it. Whereas if you if you're not sure on something, you might be like, oh, no, I'm wanting to make that. I'm kind of in that that mindset that kind of only works in sports because if you're like this with other things, people would be like, mate, you're as arrogant as it gets. But then with sport, it's kind of like, I believe I deserve to be the best I could possibly be. I deserve to get all this, like to travel the world, get to all these races, have all these experiences because I put in daily. Um, I, I pretty much, I want it as bad as I want to breathe. And then like how we said earlier about the touch of death thing, I think that's a massive thing into learning how bad you know you want something. Right. In there. Like um, there's an ET talk on YouTube and it pretty much goes on to be like, um, if you want something as bad as you want to breathe, you'll get it. Because in his story, he's like, this guy went to a monk or some guy and he's like, I want to be a successful business person, took him down to the water. And then he was like, all right, we'll go to the water. And he's like, oh, while I'm in the water, I want to be a successful business person. Um, so they walked out and then this guy's like held his head underwater and he just starts thrashing around and screaming. And he's like, what, what was the guy there? And then the monk's like, like, what did you want? When you were underwater, what was the one thing that was on your mind? And he goes, I wanted a breath of air. And he goes, that's how bad you got to want everything. And then for me, that was heaps relatable because I've been out surfing, um, in massive waves and had like a fallen off a wave held down had another wave come before i was able to get up for a breath of air and almost passed out i was able to get rescued in time but for me i know what it's like to drown almost i got Mm. you get that feeling like okay that's what death feels like and it's like how much did i want to breathe and survive in that moment that's how much i gotta want anything that i want need or deserve in life so then that's that's how i train 30 hours a week because i believe that i deserve to get to where i want to be (laughs) i love it man i love it man i'm in your corner i'm rooting for you i hope we can get some training in sometime i know we're we're kind of on opposite uh opposite sides (laughs) of this planet but uh i'm sure someday it'll happen man someday i'll get down to australia or we'll we'll find each other at a race or something along the way but uh this has been good man trav i want to um I, you know i'm really interested in doing a some kind of like a group like if we, we could do like a zoom thing like this get a few vegan athletes vegan yeah. triathletes and do like a uh do like a group call at some point so i'll definitely uh be in touch with you about that and uh yeah, set, cool. set something up like that i think that'd be really really cool if you're if you'd be into it yeah and um yeah, man. Thank you so much for coming on again today. And uh, we'll, uh, if, if you want to follow you, maybe just let people know where, where's the best, best place to find you across social media. Uh, yeah, pretty much Instagram is where I'm, I'm most active. Um, I think that's at Travis Coleman PT. Um, and then, we'll link it, link it in the show notes for anybody who yeah. wants, to, wants to check that out. So we'll link to your Instagram. And have you got a website or? The- uh, I do, yeah. Oh, I shouldn't. I think it's TravisColemanPT.com. Cool. I think it's that simple, yeah. And the yeah. the name of the the meals again that was Garden um, of Vegan. Garden of Vegan. Yeah. Beautiful. So we'll put that in the show notes as well. And yeah, once again, just thanks for coming on, man. We'll uh, we'll do it again sometime. Thanks a lot, Travis. Yeah, no worries. Cheers. Have a good one. <laughs>